I'd like to bridge now into our first work package. And for this one, I'd like uh, to welcome Philip uh, Quirk and John Barnes, who will introduce us to work package number one, the impact of the gut microbiome on colorectal cancer risk, prevention, and screening. Professor uh, Philip Quirk is head of pathology and data analytics at the University of Leeds, UK and a gastrointestinal pathologist by training with a long-standing interest in bowel cancer. John is a bowel cancer survivor and an exceptionally active patient advocate, bringing his expertise to many organizations, including Bowel Cancer Intelligence UK and the NHS Colorectal uh, Cancer Expert Group. Thank you to both for this introductory session on the microbiome. So uh, good evening, Dr. Quirk and John Barnes. Um, welcome to our fireside chat with respect to the microbiome and uh, the and cancer risk and colorectal cancer risk. Um, wanted to ask you a few questions, and we're going to just have a little discussion about this. Uh, what is the goal, first of all, of your work with Cancer Research UK, um, including the microbiome and colorectal cancer risk? So the, the aim of the whole optimistic package is to try and work out the role of the microbiome in bowel cancer and to try and exploit that knowledge in order to improve the outcomes for patients. The work package that uh, myself and John are involved in with Cindy Sears from John Hopkins is that we're looking at the earlier applications of the microbiome. So we're looking at developing screening and seeing whether we can use the microbiome in screening programs. We're also looking at whether um, a, a syndrome called Lynch, which is affects 3% of bowel cancer patients, uh, which is a hereditary condition, whether we see exactly the same microbiome changes within that and whether the cancers develop in exactly the same way because of uh, the microbiome. Uh, and we also uh, looking at um, other populations around the world to see whether the sorts of advances that we generate are applicable worldwide or, and the role that they might play in bowel cancer. So as I understand it, we're looking to see various microbes that are inside the bowel or the colon that might actually cause colon cancer or bowel cancer as referred to in the UK. Um, have we identified some of these microbes and can we, can we talk a little bit about that? So uh, the, the optimistic program has already made a major advance in that for the first time it's identified a bacterium that if it carries a small little segment of um, a special uh, piece of DNA that creates um, a protein which is called colibactin that that protein can actually damage the DNA of a very special gene that's fundamentally involved in bowel cancer. So Optimistic has been able to show that about one in 10 patients will have been affected by this bacterium and this bacterium is potentially playing a direct role. And so what we're working towards in our work package is seeing how well those bacteria will identify the patients who are carrying bowel cancer and might enable us to identify them and whether that's the basis of a new screening test. Cancers are picked up by that fecal immunochemical test. But the other half are missed um, with other countries, so Chile, Argentina, Vietnam, India, and Cindy Sears has done work with uh, other countries, Malaysia, uh, etc. And what we're seeing is some of the same bacteria in those populations. So we may be able to develop a worldwide screening test, which if that was the case would of course be fantastic. Do I understand that, that this uh, work will not just impact the sensitivity and specificity of the fecal immunochemical test, but add an additional uh, component which will help uh, to identify those patients um, who may be at higher risk um, more so than the average population, those who are at average risk. 
can you explain a little bit about the differences between your work as it affects those who are already at high risk, for example, because of a family relation or genetic, as you mentioned, the Lynch syndrome before, uh, and those of the general population, um, you know, who are just at an average risk and have no uh, reason to suspect that they may have colon cancer? By far and away, the largest and most important group, I mean, is the 97% of patients you know, who are in the general population and identifying the cancers in those individuals. Now, one of the fascinating things that we don't know yet is that if we, so we can use the microbiome to identify the people carrying the cancers. We can even identify some of the people carrying some of the precursors. But what we don't know is if we did a, a microbiome test at the age of 20, could we identify people who have bad bugs? And could we actually get them to eat a healthier diet? And diet's really important in changing the background microbiome. Uh, can we get them to change their bacterial microbiome, which will reduce their risk of bowel cancer? And that's going to be a really interesting future uh, stream of research is what is the value of somebody carrying a healthy microbiome versus an unhealthy microbiome? And can we intervene very early? John, I wanted to ask you some questions about your work in uh, research with the Cancer Research UK optimistic um, work package. Um, how do you, how have you found working on this project and and how has it made an impact on yourself? First of all, I'd say it's exceedingly rewarding. Uh, my, my, my own personal circumstances is that I'm a, fortunately a long-term bowel cancer survivor. Sadly, there are people that die from bowel cancer and people that are short-term survivors. So to get involved with the project that uh, I, I feel that stands a great opportunity of reducing the incidence of bowel cancer and hopefully reducing the uh, and increasing the survival of bowel cancer it is a very, very well worth project. In, in terms of the impact that you've had on this research, I know you've had a lot of impact because we work together. Can you explain what impact that you've had in working together with Dr. Quirk and, and the other researchers in this project? Yeah, uh, first and foremost, in relation to, to my work with, with Phil and Work Package One, well, we've, we've met on a regular basis, and he's been a great help explaining to me in simple terms the science that's gone on behind his particular work package, and indeed the science that's gone on within the other work packages. You know, at the end of the day, I'm a person, I'm just a simple bloke that caught bowel cancer. <laughs> Uh, uh, and I, I don't understand the science. So, and, and I think the, the, the other effect I've had on, on some of the, the, the other investigators is the, the need to be able to put the research they're doing into simple lay terms that the guy in the street understands. Uh, and, uh, you know, that's I, I great. Dr. Quirk, from your perspective as a researcher, working with a patient advocate involved in research. What impact has uh, John had on your work? Well, as, as well as becoming a friend uh, and giving me a greater understanding of having bowel cancer. Um, I mean, the patient advocates are uh, really inspiring. Um, and you know, it's really sad when uh, the disease takes its toll on them and uh, it's taking its toll on many of uh, our colleagues so that is added impetus to push us to actually get patient orientated solutions to this disease one thing i'd like to say is that i've had access to lead investigators in every project i think work package that's done and and every time i've been responded to immediately uh, so you know, every part of this project uh, has embraced the role of, uh, and the importance of, of, of patient advocates. And, and, and that is something that I didn't expect, uh, but it's been very, very uh, much appreciated. 
Thank you very much, Philip and John, uh, for sharing your experiences uh, with, um, with Optimistic and the um, learning that each person has been bringing to the table because of the interaction between patients and researchers. I think what's quite interesting about the work is the discovery of the bacterium and how it can and will play a role in future developments. And that's something I believe everyone will want to stay close to. I also wanted to pick up on a comment that John made about uh, the responsiveness. And, and you can see the enthusiasm and you'll see the enthusiasm in each and every one of the segments of this webinar um, that patients have been embraced by researchers and researchers are embracing patients. It is groundbreaking work.